Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Beatriz Cantata. I use a she pronoun series. I work in the Institute Community and Equity Office. I'm the Director of Engagement for Diversity and Inclusion. Thank you for joining us this afternoon in our hybrid event. So we have folks in the space. We are now in Bush Room, um, coming in live from the Bush Room. And we also have folks um, virtually. And I see there are about 28 of a uh, few in uh, joining us via Zoom. Um, so this is our second ICO community dialogue. So we're happy to have Danny Becker and Jack Jacqueline Lieberman joining us um, from, um, Danny is from Priscilla um, King Gray, PKG, and um, Jacqueline is joining us from Seoul, which is a student organization, leadership and engagement. Ooh, got 50% of that. Mm. So um, the other thing I do want to point out um, are just a few acknowledgements. This is a team effort to get this hybrid event happening. So I'd like to acknowledge DJ Rachel O in the back. Uh, Woohoo! And we have Nick here from AV helping us out. And also joining us is Angela, who is our ASL interpreter this afternoon. Hello, Angela. Welcome. So. Um, some of you um, can smell the food. We have um, Turkish food um, with us this afternoon. And we also want to make sure that our, the folks, participants joining us um, virtually also get some food. So guess what? We're sending you an Uber, Uber Eats link voucher. And Rachel will take care of that via chat session. So we don't want you to miss out. We have food here. And hopefully, you'll get some food too. OK, so COVID-19 guidelines just um, particularly for those who are here in person, just a reminder, please maintain appropriate distance, um, wear your mask if you're not actively eating or drinking. Um, and other than that, welcome. And I will pass the virtual mic to Danny and Jacqueline. Take it away. Thank you, Beatrice. So much appreciated. And thank you to all of ICEO. Uh, as anyone can name on campus, it is doing incredible work as an office, really pushing the conversations about identity. And we're excited to be a part of it. Uh, so like Beatrice mentioned, my name is Danny Becker. I am the program coordinator at the PKG Center for Public Service. I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment. Click it over. Yes. And hi, everyone. I am Jacqueline Lieberman. I am the Associate Director for Student Activities and Leadership Programs at the Seoul Office, um, which is formerly known as the Student Activities Office, but our new name is the Student Organizations Leadership and Engagement Office at MIT. Yeah, so for both of us, uh, for students out there, staff, uh, alumni, parents, if you're interested in learning more about either of our centers after we share a little more, please always feel free to reach out to us by email. Uh, you can set up a time to chat with us. We are always looking to find ways to engage the community. Uh, so uh, before we jump in, we wanted to really just acknowledge the land that we exist on. Uh, MIT is a part of a movement of different institutions that are really beginning to share what are called land acknowledgements with audiences before they're presenting. Uh, so this specific land acknowledgement was created by the MIT Indigenous Peoples Advocacy Committee in partnership with MIT's American Indian Science and Engineering Society, as well as the Native American Student Association, uh, as well as other Indigenous MIT students and alumni. Uh, so just to take that moment uh, to acknowledge that MIT acknowledges Indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation, and we acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse Indigenous peoples connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. I think what's really important is in a conversation about power and privilege, uh, this is a really wonderful place to begin, right? We can think about what are large ways to create social change, but we can also think about what are those small ways, those daily behaviors you can tweak. Uh, one of them might be reading something like this before a meeting or a workshop or something else you're doing. Uh, for me, I was raised by a Native American grandfather. Uh, he rebuilt his Potawatomi reservation. So really taking this time to acknowledge the land we're on is for me important. Uh, and Land acknowledgements are one step that the PKG Center, as well as other partners like Seoul, are taking to really ensure that our work is anti-racist and anti-oppressive. So a part of that work is us understanding who are we engaging? Who's coming to our events? Who is being a part of these conversations? So in a part of that movement, please feel free to uh, simply go to the survey and identify yourself. You don't need to put your name, uh, but if you'd like, this can help us understand who are the identities we're reaching? Who are we not? 
And how do we shift our work to make sure that we are reaching everyone that we can? Now, so uh, over the next roughly 45 minutes, we have a few things we wanna do. The number one thing that we wanna do with you is talk. We wanna have a conversation about case studies on campus. Uh, but before we do that, we know that for some folks you might be newer to this conversation. Maybe you've been to different workshops about identity. And uh, we just wanted to give some baseline information that Jacqueline and I use to really think about the case studies that we'll be negotiating. Uh, so with that in mind, we're gonna start about, we're gonna start with thinking about yourself. How can you start this type of work? Uh, we're gonna look at a video about how power plays out in the real world. And we're gonna look at an intersecting axes of oppression. It's a framework that helps at least me make sense of this giant scary thing called the system. So we'll hopefully make some sense of it. And then finally, uh, we'll do some case study examples, discussion and a debrief. Jacqueline, anything else you're excited for? No, just uh, feel free, this is like, an open and safe space. Um, we have, we'll talk about it more in the next slide, but um, whoever is on Zoom will be monitoring the chat. So feel free to either unmute yourselves or write in the chat if you have any questions at all. Um, obviously anyone in the room can just speak up if you have any questions. Um, but this is supposed to be like an interactive workshop with discussion um, that will be open uh, to everyone. So if you don't wanna hear us speak anymore, please stop us and seek for yourselves um, yeah. and add to the discussion. Jump in. Uh, so to help us do that, we have some communication norms, as we all might imagine, having conversations about identity, especially at work or at school, can be really tricky, right? So what we ask is to think about these at least seven points, and then uh, we can add more if you'd like. So feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, so when we're speaking, we want to, of course, give each other the benefit of the doubt, right? Of course, things might come out in an awkward way, in a strange way, in a way that might actually offend someone. That's okay for us. Uh, that's what these spaces are for. But really just thinking about the benefit of the doubt is key. Uh, we also encourage you all to take the lessons. So if you learn something from a conversation, like, please feel free to share that. But uh, think about the identities. So we ask that you keep the identity in the room. This way, uh, you're kind of not crossing someone's boundaries in terms of what they are willing to be known for saying or thinking on campus. Uh, and then finally, lead with curiosity and listening. This is one way that when we see something different, something that might not make immediate sense to us and our identities, just taking that second to be curious, to lean in, to ask questions in a friendly way. Uh, Jacqueline, do you want to take the other three? Yeah, uh, we have all participants have opinions and perspectives of value. So just know we have people from all different spaces and communities um, having this conversation. So there will be different perspectives um, that you might not agree with. So just be open and willing. I usually say like, don't get my young, sort of like that. Um, civil disagreements, pretty self-explanatory. Um, avoid either uh, or avoid saying either or or right or wrong, everyone's opinions are safe and open um, to interpretation and take space, make space. So please, please feel free to speak up, share your opinions, but um, also give others the opportunity um, to share their um, own concerns or opinions or feedback, whatever it is, answers. Yeah, would anyone like to add any other thoughts, guidelines, norms for our community? If you're virtual, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll see them pop up. I'll give you all a second. Okay, if something does come up, feel free to raise your hand, let us know. Yeah, Shelly. Um, don't take anything personally. Yes, don't take anything personally. I think uh, that's really important, right? Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes it might hit us personally, right? And really taking that second to say, this wasn't meant to be personal. This is a part of conversation. This is us growing together. I think that's really important. Okay, so let's say maybe this is the first workshop you've been to about a topic like this. Where might you start? We know that starting this type of work can be really intimidating and heavy. Uh, however, for us, we're actually gonna start at reviewing um, ourselves. What's the power and privilege that we have? What does that power look like? And then how can different frameworks really help us continue to move forward? Uh, but before we do that, you might be asking, why am I presenting or why is Jacqueline presenting? So we wanted to take a second just to introduce the work that we do on campus. Uh, the team at the PKG Center is a multidisciplinary team that all prepares students to create social change. For us, thinking about social change through systemic challenges is really important. So in other words, how does identity impact things like access to healthcare, access to transportation, access to green spaces? And how do we support students in creating systemic change using 
their unique MIT skill sets. I think we all know that MIT offers students skill sets that few other places can't. Uh, how do we leverage those for the bubble good? For us, you're the only one raising your thumbs up. Right? I know, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> There you go. For us at MIT, we look at social change through 12 different lenses. For us, we understand that not every approach is gonna be perfect for everyone. I'm a big protester. I love screaming on the streets. Jacqueline is a big relationship builder. She really builds relationships with nonprofits, organizations. She's not someone that'll be at the front of the protests. And that's the beauty of social justice work. For both of us and for everyone, really finding the route that is most impactful for you is key in this process. And, uh, so the PKG Center takes all of that knowledge and we offer students a range of opportunities, paid internships and fellowships. Uh, we have public service opportunities like our immersion programs in the Navajo Nation. Uh, we have social innovation programs in advising. So ideas are social innovation challenge. Those are all opportunities to connect students uh, and in some cases, community members to social change. And uh, what's really important is that we aim to be as flexible and cost neutral as possible. We understand that the folks participating in our programs have some of the identities that we're actually often talking about, right? Uh, they might not have the flexibility to participate fully in some traditional programs. So for us, we really work to be as flexible as possible to meet them where they are. And I'm loving this clicker. If it goes. All right. Yeah, we have a series of events coming up. So if you're interested in stopping by to learn more, uh, we have our Ideas Chat and Chew series. It's a series of programs looking at social innovations and systems-led change. We have a multi-part series on power. This is kind of a glimpse into the first part, uh, but that's currently being advertised. You can check it out at bit.ly backslash MIT power in all lowercase. That's in partnership with the Seoul office and the OMP office. PKG. Yes. And then uh, for the PKG Center, we also have our IEP Health Showcase, where our students who are working with Boston Medical Center will showcase the great work they've done. Uh, and Davis Projects for Peace, uh, we award one project on campus $10,000 to create any social change that students want. Uh, they kind of design their project from the ground up. Yes. And here we have the Seoul Office. Um, smaller team, but uh, we are the office uh, in charge of advising all student boards on campus, uh, all student board finances, and obviously our leadership program, uh, which this year uh, we've actually have a focus on social creating social change leaders. So a lot of focus around DEI, uh, social change opportunities and initiatives, and obviously doing a lot of uh, partner work with the PKG Center. So the next slide, um, we'll show some upcoming <laughs> some upcoming um, workshops for the spring. Um, these are all, these are pretty much open to all students. Um, we don't have like specific dates for a lot of them, but the first we have the Community Catalyst Leadership Program for our sophomore students, so they're paired with MIT alumni uh, to coach them in leadership opportunities. We have the Power Series Exploration Through Case Studies that we're doing with again DKG and OMP. Um, and that'll be throughout IAP. We have the I Am A Leader Conference um, that we're partnering with OMP, um, and that'll be two weeks during February. Uh, virtual leadership uh, yeah. will be occurring in the spring, um, and that'll be open to all graduate students. So if you have anyone in mind, please send them over to me. Um, and then we have our personal empowerment series that are gonna be a series of workshops throughout the spring semester around the empowering students to become stronger leaders. Um, and if you have any questions about that or want to be involved in any way, please reach out. Yeah, one thing I'll point out, the Power Series Exploration Through Case Studies. Uh, it's an IEP, it'll be a multi, uh, step process. If you like today's session where we actually talk about what power and privilege looks like in a situation, please join us for that. It is entirely that. There won't really be framing. There won't be like, here's how we think about gender or identity. It's going to be, how does gender play into a situation like the, the Theranos court case that's happening right now around social innovation and health? Um, so really kind of already having chewed on some of those initial ideas of identity or just kind of coming in to listen about how they play out. Now let's get started. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about. How do we get started? Uh, so my big recommendations for folks who really have very little idea of how to get started. Maybe you come from a community that almost entirely looks like you. Maybe you were raised in schools or uh, you attended uh, different sporting events or even when you went grocery shopping, maybe everyone looked like you. So this new world where we're asking and 
demanding for each other to be thoughtful about other people and identities uh, can be intimidating, right? So I always recommend first starting with listening, right? Uh, for those folks who might not have experience with diverse identities or communities, uh, what we have found to be the most impactful is active listening. That really sends the message to the community that you care about them and that you're not an expert on their lived reality. Many of us might've heard the phrase white savior before, the idea of white folks kind of going into communities and saying, I know how to solve this issue. Let me do it for you. I'm gonna do this great thing, right? Uh, we really encourage folks to first listen ask questions, right? What's been done already? What's happening? What can I get involved with? How can I help you and your leadership, right? So really thinking and starting there is important. In that process, you'll likely be consuming diverse narratives. So uh, just as not every white or black person has the same experience, not every queer person or every woman has the same experience. In this process of listening, you'll be consuming those, those experiences, right? Folks will be sharing their challenges, their ideas, their successes, and really including all of those stories in your own conception of how folks navigate the world is important. It can help us get a diverse experience uh, and it can really help teach us along the way. And then uh, thinking about media. So often a lot of our initial ideas about what does it mean to be black? What does it mean to be queer in America? It often begins with the TV shows we are watching at two, three, four years old, right? The things our parents were watching around us. Uh, what I call social messaging. I think what's really important is to be critical of the social messaging that we're taking in. So maybe that means looking at the shows and the things that you're already paying attention to and asking how is identity showing up, right? How is race playing a factor here? How is gender playing a factor? A part of that might be the realization of, oh, this is a community that I don't know much about. And like, how do I get started, right? So that's why I have the Selena series on Netflix up here. Uh, as a Mexican-American from the same area, Selena, that film, and the series, I think, really speaks to a number of ideas of what does it mean to be Chicano or Tejano in America. Uh, we see a family struggle with poverty. We see the family struggle with SNAP and food stamps. Uh, we see the family struggle with pride. What does it mean to be a proud man having, having uh, supported your family and then all of a sudden need to turn to living on your uh, brother's floor, right? So really paying attention to who is creating these pieces of media, what are the messages that they're trying to share, and how do we see that in the world around us is really key. And then finally, a big piece here throughout all of this is self-reflection, right? Asking ourselves, how do we see identity? How does our identity show up in the ways that we're talking about this? And Jacqueline's gonna take us one step further with this tool called an identity wheel. Yeah, so as Danny was saying, your first step, about your own power or privilege is self-reflection and looking at yourself and what parts of your identity are most important to you. And you can do this by looking at three dimensions um, that are mentioned above. Here we have the outer layer of the circle, the organizational dimensions, the external dimensions, internal, and then ultimately the deepest dimension, which is your personality, the hardest one to get to. Um, so it's always important to really reflect ever so often, I do it like because of these workshops once a week, um, on what makes up your multiple identities. Um, and also, what do you know about other people and their identities? Um, do, you more, do you know more about their more internal dimensions? Or do you know mostly uh, maybe your coworkers or other staff or faculty more of like their organizational dimensions? And maybe that's something you wanna reflect on more to get to know them a little deeper. Yeah, I think what's really special about this is I always look at the outer ring kind of as the information that might be on a business card, right? This is my title. This is where I work. Maybe you'll share, I've been at this workplace for this long, right? Those things don't often take a lot of vulnerability, right? If you share where you uh, work or what your title is, you might not be at risk for physical violence, for example. Now, going inward, uh, we see different things, religion and spirituality, appearance, parental status, income. Some of these categories, I always say, uh, you might be able to see them, right? You might get an idea. You might make an assumption based on what you can see, uh, which is something that you have to reflect on, right? Thinking about what are the assumptions we're making about these pieces. Uh, but some of those external dimensions are still pretty visible. And what I always argue impact the way we navigate the world. We'll talk about that in a second. And then going in, uh, I think Jacqueline was spot on. These pieces, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, 
right? Uh, you'll see throughout this workshop, some of our tools, we might tweak the language we use when talking about it. Uh, tools like this are often made years ago and this field is constantly changing rapidly. Uh, so with that in mind, I would change this to a gender identity uh, and just to acknowledge that some of those things are harder to see, right? It takes conversation, it takes relationship for someone to feel safe being vulnerable with you, right? So thinking back to the example of violence, uh, you might be less likely to experience violence depending on your management status, but depending on the community you're in, depending on your context, if you share that you identify as gay to the wrong person, that could have physical ramifications, right? Uh, now, this is just to say that uh, over time through relationship, you'll learn and build that trust to have those conversations, but it takes a second to get there. Yeah, and I would also just point out, um, me and Danny were speaking about this earlier, What's also missing from here is like being like first generation mm -hmm. uh, in this country, in college, it's not necessarily like stated on here, um, but that would be also something you can't, you wouldn't know about someone unless you spoke to them about it or they brought it up. It wouldn't be something you might assume of them, um, mm -hmm. but that would also probably fall under more of the um, external dimensions. Yes. Before we move on, how does this land with you all? Do any of us have comments, thoughts, challenges, ideas? Maybe you also see something missing from this chart yeah. that we already pointed out. Yep, and well, this is open to all chat participants too. Yeah. I am monitoring it, so <laughs> please write in the chat. We'll go ahead and we'll circle back to this question. Um, I think what's important about these next few slides is this is a great theoretical foundation, right? This helps us think about our identities in these small pieces. And what we're gonna ask you to do for the rest of our time together is think about how do these small pieces give us power or take away our power. Uh, before we really open up conversation though, we wanted to provide a video to really show how can these things uh, play out in our real life and how do they play out from very early on in our life. Uh, this was a video that I encountered actually through sexual, sexual, sexual assault response training. Uh, so this is the material that they share with folks who are being trained 40 hours a week to engage folks who have actually experienced sexual violence. Uh, so it's a video and a perspective that I really value and I hope you all do as well. Uh, Jacqueline, any other thoughts? Uh, no, I'll just hopefully click on the right button. You got it. Think of a baby when it's born as a simple stick figure. Pretend identity is like the first set of clothes given to them by others who expect them to wear that style throughout their life. Now consider their personal style, might be color or hairstyle, as clothes that they would pick to best match their personality. Likewise, gender identity is shaped at birth when a doctor assigns gender. Grandparents then begin to describe boys as having strong cries or gift girls pink headbands with bows. For some, gender assignment and all that is associated with it is without conflict. As we mature, we carry this assigned identity as we engage with social structures like schools. Cisgender kids go into their assigned boys or girls bathroom without hesitation. Walking into a different bathroom is met with redirection. For transgender and gender queer people, however, the assignment of gender at birth is painful. Their identities create tensions and are in opposition to assigned gender roles, behaviors, and expectations from friends, family, and society. They worry, which bathroom is safe for me? This tension also happens around language. In the US, English is considered a primary or sole language, and this affects everyone's identity. Unless you are in a foreign language class or a bilingual school, there can be stigma about speaking languages other than English in the classroom or in the playground. You may receive messages that English is the only acceptable language in school. The social messaging is that speaking another language is shameful and problematic, while speaking English, ideally without an accent, is rewarded as good behavior. In this way, Spanish-speaking family members are stigmatized as others and speaking Spanish becomes undesirable. This process explains why, regardless of country of origin, children of non-English speakers lose their language by the third generation. 
These are just a couple examples that demonstrate how social structures construct, limit, and place value on identities. This becomes highly problematic when school completion, racial profiling, poverty, and health disparities are associated with specific identities. Social messages from schools, peers, and the media are conflicting. They tell us that all men are created equal despite what is actually reinforced by everyday interactions, like the classic example of a white woman who guards her purse in the elevator when a black man enters. A clash begins when the social messaging and the actual experiences do not match. We cannot be equal if we define one group as better or even superior to another based on gender or racial identification. Whiteness is the preferred norm, the identity that all other identities are compared to or contrasted against. The norm of whiteness is so strong that it is invisible. For instance, when describing a person, if their race is not described, the assumption is that they are white. Inequality touches all parts of our lives, even when we're thinking of starting a healthy family. We assume that education, income, and healthy lifestyles should produce the same healthy birth outcomes regardless of race in the U.S. Yet research indicates that regardless of age, education, income, and healthy behaviors, and unrelated to genetics, black women in the U.S. have poorer birth outcomes than their white counterparts. Black women experience increased infant deaths, maternal deaths, and low birth weights. Many scientists associate the resulting poorer birth outcomes to increased stress related to experiences of racism. But how do we have social change in equity when those who are most affected can be demoralized and frustrated by their everyday attempts to achieve the same outcomes as their white counterparts? Our relationship to identity groups can be the key to creating change. Since social inequities occur predominantly to communities of color, social transformation requires, among other things, a mobilization of identity. Social movements based in identity, such as the Black Liberation Movement, the Chicano Movement, and the Women's Rights Movement, harness identity by educating people about social structural inequality and its impact on them. In this way, social movements can create an educated counter-narrative. Stories like that of Benjamin Banneker, a black architect who was hired by Thomas Jefferson to build the White House after the French architect Pierre Charles L'Enfant stormed off the job. This exemplifies Banneker's invisibility in U.S. history and the prominence of L'Enfant, who has a metro stop named after him in Washington, D.C. Knowing the invisible history and cultural icons of communities can be used to coalesce people of a shared identity and can call forth other successful historical struggles. For instance, the United Farm Workers Union and their leaders Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta carried banners of Our Lady of Guadalupe as they marched from Delano to Sacramento, California to demand justice for farm workers. The same icon was used by Father Miguel Hidalgo in Mexico's fight for independence from Spain and again in the Mexican Revolution by Emiliano Zapata. The way that these icons were used are also evidence that global and national struggles for transformational change can be organized at local levels. As people committed to social change, the questions for us are, how much do we really understand about the history and legacies of the communities in which we work? And, as both insiders and outsiders of these communities, how do we use the power of narrative informed by cultural histories of contribution, resistance, and justice to activate change in grassroots community organizing? I know that there's a lot there. Before we jump into that, we did see one comment come through the chat. I think about personality. Yeah, it says it occurs to me that personality kind of goes on the outside too. That is, what we think our personality is, we base on our understanding of all the layers underneath. And it takes interrogating and peeling away those layers to get to the core personality that is the real one. Wow, that is a yeah. That is a good response. Yeah, I think that's spot on. You also have me thinking about the personality that we show in some contexts and the personality we show in other contexts, right? So as a queer gay man, 
I would say I'm a slightly different person at work than I am at home uh, compared to a social event with my queer peers. Uh, a part of that is because I'm aware that my identity uh, can be a risk and I have to manage that, right? That's kind of a reality that I've grown up with, I have seen in the workplace and I think impacts the work that I do. And I think it this plays the part in anyone, like the personality that you put, like your professional stance, like the way you present yourself at work versus at home. It could be even like that phone voice that you put on yeah. is different um, than what you would speak like with your parents, for example, or siblings or friends. So I think that's super important to point out. Yeah. If you're interested, <laughs> yeah. If you're interested in learning more, I would recommend Googling or looking more into what's called code switching. Uh, the idea that we might use different language depending on where we are. I also just want to name that there are some personality styles that have more power in America. Are there any ideas in the room what personality style that might be? Um, is it like the introvert, extrovert conversation? Which, yeah, which one do you think has more power in America, oh, Jacqueline? Extroverts. Yes. <laughs> That's what people assume. Yeah. But we've had workshops that uh, we've discussed that it's not necessarily the case. Yeah, I think that's the, the kind of narrative, right? If you can speak well, if you are friendly, if you're gregarious, you'll do well anywhere. But if you're introverted, good luck, you should learn how to change that, right? And instead, we really have to think about what do both personality and communication styles uh, bring to the table, right? How do we leverage them all? How do we value them all? Um, but I think that's definitely a part of this personality piece. So I know this video gave a lot of information uh, and for some of you, it might be confusing. So I wanted to share this tool to help us actually make sense of all the identities that were kind of being thrown at us in the video. Uh, so each line is a type of identity. So you might see uh, being like age or attractiveness or class. Uh, within the circle, you can see the isms. And then uh, the idea here is that through a number of different factors, which we'll briefly talk about, uh, some identities have uh, more power or above uh, what Morgan would call this line of domination and some have less power. So identities below this line of domination. I also like this chart because of the intersecting lines. I don't know if it shows it perfectly, but for me at least it references the idea of intersectionality. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw uh, in the late 80s did a lot of work around this concept of multiple identities layering on each other. And those multiple identities possibly uh, kind of compounding on one another or possibly mitigating each other or just making it much more complicated to navigate. So for example, I must navigate the world as a queer brown man, not just a brown man and not just a queer man. Uh, and that's a part of my story. Yeah. And I would point out, I think from the video too, um, what stood out to me the most, um, I don't know if anyone has already assumed this or hasn't at all, but I'm actually uh, Jewish and Latina. English is actually my second language. Mm -hmm. um, and just the way that they brought this up in the video as um, people who struggle, like my parents had to fight um, to have us not like to be go like to go into school speaking Spanish. The teachers were super upset at them that they never taught us English at home. Um, but that's something that they fought for because of their strong Latino roots. Um, right. And I think for the most part, I struggled with that in school. It brought me down in some ways, but now um, I see it as a form of power and privilege for myself having the second language being completely fluent, um, but it was like a struggle for me growing up. So I think that's what really stood out for me and pointed it out here is like English is an additional yeah. language. <laughs> Should we go through, if it makes, yeah. if it sounds, sounds good to all of you, we'll go through Jacqueline's identity. I would say never go to someone and say, I'd like to interpret your identity, right? Uh, but Jacqueline and I have agreed that I this is a- volunteer myself. <laughs> yes. So let's just kind of go line by line. Jacqueline, do you identify as feminine or female or as uh, maybe trans? This word, gender deviance, not a big fan. I would edit that. Female. Female, so above the line. Uh, sexism. Well, first sexism, male or female? Female. Okay, so you go down here. Mm -hmm. There. Uh, how do you identify racially? I'm white. Yeah. Uh, are you of European heritage or non-European heritage? Russian. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Yeah. So this is complicated, just because what I know of Jacqueline, like she has that identity. She also identifies as Jewish. Yeah. It's a big part of her identity. I met her through the Jewish community, and it's always a gift to see that. Uh, I think that impacts that piece, right? Uh, heterosexism, 
Are you LGBTQ or heterosexual? Heterosexual. Up there. <laughs> Uh, wealth is, um, would you say you're financially stable? I am financially stable. Okay. Uh, not disabled mental, uh, health, good mental health. Again, this is some framing I would probably keep. Yeah, I am a good mental health. Okay. Credential. <laughs> Do you have degrees, Jacqueline? Yes, I have multiple degrees. Just lots. Uh, age, would you consider yourself young, old, somewhere in the middle? I consider myself young, others say opposite. But yes. Yeah. So this is a, this is a great example where her age, that identity that comes with age, is changing. Right? She might have navigated the workplace in one way ten years ago, uh, but might be navigating it differently and will over the next couple of decades. Uh, do you identify as attractive, Jacqueline? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Upper upper middle class or uh, yeah. Yep. Language bias. So this goes into your Spanish speaking, right? Yes. I prefer actually to speak Spanish than English. Yep, so below. Uh, you identify as light skin because you identify as white. Um, Anti-Semitism. You're Jewish. I am Jewish. I don't know why it lists it specifically as anti-Semitism there, but yep. that's another discussion. And then uh, this question about uh, fertility. I'm not going to put you on the spot there. Uh, <laughs> but what, what do you all notice about that quick uh, discussion? And we'll keep an eye on the chat as well. I also point out I'm first generation Latina puts me at the bottom of some of these. Yeah. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated, right? It's it takes a lot of self-reflection and often you're gonna be some above and some below the line. That's okay. Uh, there you might be someone who all of your identities are below the line of domination. That's reality. You might be someone who your identities are above, uh, but I would say more often than not. Uh, folks usually have a mix of these. Uh, are there any comments in the chat? Um, there's something about extroverts and introverts. Yeah. Um, most of these axes are not recognized as protected class status, but play out keenly in our experiences of privilege and oppression. Yes, good point. Some of these, uh, like race or gender, depending on who you ask, may or may not be built into our law system to prevent discrimination from that, right? Others of these are not. And some of them are actually giant political debates about whether we should protect these identities by law. Now, before we really open up the discussion for the last 20 minutes, I have a question for you all. What do you think are some of the possible root causes of the system? Any ideas? Um, oh, in the chat. Is there one in the chat, check on? White supremacy. White supremacy, yes. I would say that's definitely a cause. And I would even go further. What might be a root cause of white supremacy? Where might some of that binary thinking, black, white thinking, fear, greed, greed social hierarchy, white supremacy? I, uh, for the sake of time, want to move us to the scenarios, but I think really emphasizing that greed piece for me is important because when I look at this, I look back at some of our history. I look at colonialism, colonialism, uh, which countries, which identities were able to colonize others, who was able to shift uh, the reality of nationality on the ground. Uh, the history of slavery. Uh, there's an amazing Abraham Lincoln doc documentary on CNN right now. If you're interested, I would say check it out. Uh, capitalism, that greed piece, right? Uh, if you have the identities with more power, you're more likely to be in a position of power where you uh, make more money, right? Uh, it's hard to give up that money. It's hard to give up power. Uh, and then gendered framework. So uh, in some religious faiths, uh, what gender you identify with will impact the amount of power you have within that community, if that makes sense. Uh, and then I would also argue sexuality and morality, right? This idea that there are ways to be moral and ways to not be moral. And often in, uh, throughout our history, you see this uh, combination of an identity and being moral or not moral. So for example, um, when colonization really first started during the scramble for Africa, there was an idea that these were people that had no morals. They needed to be rescued. They needed to be changed, right? Uh, I would argue that we have broken past that a little bit. Uh, and I think it's constantly worth thinking about. In the chat, I just want to point out someone wrote control and someone else wrote general, uh, general, oh my God. Do you want to take a look? Not yet. <laughs> this is my, 
Generational trauma. Generational. Yes, I think absolutely. A lot of these things have really been some of the kicker, some of the engine for intergenerational trauma, right? Uh, and I think the more that we can be thoughtful about where is that engine right now, the more we might be able to like jam up that engine, right? Slow that down. Now, we have a sense of power uh, and we wanna work through some scenarios. We originally thought uh, we would break you all up individually or in smaller groups. I think with the number that we have in the room uh, and the fact that folks are virtual, we have learned that we can hear you if you're virtual. So what we are gonna ask is that if you can, uh, over the next uh, four slides, if you have thoughts you'd like to share, please feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, for those in the room, please feel free to help us think through these challenges. Um, and whoever's on the chat or virtual, um, we do have a bit.ly link that we included here above that will have the case studies also on an Excel sheet for you. So you can write notes in it, you can take a look. Um, but obviously we encourage you to unmute yourselves and participate. Yes, and all these case studies are uh, from our reality and experience here on campus, so. Uh, Jacqueline, you first. Yeah, so case study number one, navigating school traditions. Um, many, many institutions across the US um, have a tradition, oh, here, oh, here. Uh, have a tradition where students purchase and wear their class rings. There are three different types of rings being sold, ranging from $150 to $2,000. But the tradition is that everyone should be purchasing the most expensive ring, which happens to be a 24 karat ring. Um, there is a financial aid program provided to students where they have to submit an application, and most of the students are requesting money to purchase a gold ring, this 24 karat. They claim to have enough to purchase the other less expensive rings, but need help because they want to maintain the tradition set by the alumni of the school, even if that means they won't be able to purchase food or books for the semester. How would you go about handling this school tradition? What are questions to consider when having to deal with students' actual needs and keeping the process equitable? Any initial thoughts? I was thinking that, yes, they can get the less expensive ring and have that fully covered. But if you're trying to fit in, mm -hmm. um, you want a similar ring to what other people are getting. Because if you have the less expensive one, it might signify that um, you have needs. Yeah. Um, Meaning that, okay, you're on a full life. So I guess, you know, we try to fit in as best as we can. Um, and they're willing to not have food or books because they don't want to feel the shame that society has for them. Yeah, Shelly, I think that's spot on, right? I think so often we think about the normal culture. Normal culture says you get this ring. If you don't get the ring, you are not a part of our culture. And that has personal impacts, right? Um, and I love that you named some of those emotions that might drive someone to choose the ring over who. You don't want to be the one to like to appear that you can't afford something mm -hmm. or that you're less than someone else mm -hmm. who might like purchase three gold rings. I have seen in other circumstances students wearing five rings on their hands showing off how much they were able to purchase mm -hmm. and i think um yeah <laughs> i think also too depends on how secure the person is yeah um yes you know if i'm confident i wouldn't care less what someone else thinks but then uh -huh. we have to think back when talking about 18 19 year olds yeah you know, peer pressure is very strong. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it just kind of brings me back to that very simple acknowledgement of like, that person struggling may not want to be seen as having a lower class identity, right? They don't want their class-based identity to be seen by their peers. They think it'll remove their social power. They might have less influence. They might not get invited to parties. And at least for myself, I often hear of some groups of students like, oh, we're going on vacation here or there. Uh, it's so exciting when they go away. But oftentimes I'll hear other students say like, oh, I couldn't afford to go with my friends. Um, and eventually a lot of those folks like stop being asked to join, right? They're like, oh, you can't make it. You couldn't make it before. Still like you, but I know you can't make it work, right? 
And I think that that is how some of these uh, identity-based situations can get so complicated. And I think the youth piece is even more important, right? Because in terms of pride, uh, maybe you have all other powerful identities, right? Maybe you're a straight white male. It might be a little easier for you to be like, you know, I'll take this hit. I'm okay with it. I'll wear the, the cheaper ring, right? But if you're a queer person of color who already faces challenges of a reputation of kind of being lower income, making that choice might be that much harder. Um, so I'll make like a quick comment and we have a few yeah. chats. Um, I will point out uh, for the most case, the $150 ring you wear every day. And that is assumed, like that is the ring you wear every day, the gold one you wear for special occasions. Mm -hmm. So people are purchasing multiple like a gold and a $150 ring, but there is like a pressure mm -hmm. to purchase a gold ring because that is like the higher, the highest version. Mm -hmm. um, so in the chat, um, we have, why is this institution creating a class system? There are many institutions that are doing this. Mm -hmm. And that is also a question that always comes up. And I think it's important to acknowledge that for a lot of people, higher ed anywhere you are is classes, right? It takes being a certain class to be in the space at all. So for me, it's not too surprising that uh, it becomes a class structure. Um, it's what is the purpose of having multiple financial tiers? Um, I'm assuming financial tiers is the different types of rings, yeah. and that's set by the rent company. Yep. You have students purchase more rings. Um, I get having options for designs, but to be ignorant of how it seems to practice. One ring for free. Yes, that is what we've been. Yeah. That's what's been talked about. Uh, it's also interesting, like mining for gold and the connection between uh, extraction slash mining and gold and status, like breaking the cycle is a lot of numbers. Yes, 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 yes. I think this is a great example of like, we see power every day, right? We see it on the hands of our students and alumni. And what does that mean? Yeah, we'll move on to the second case. So as with many programs at MIT, there was a cohort or a group of students traveling to a community that has little access to food, healthcare, running water, or a range of other resources. In the group's efforts to engage and learn more, they worked with a nonprofit that connects families to running water. In the process, the group engaged with the family within their home with consent, and a number of students noticed a Confederate flag hanging in the living room. How might you navigate this, and what additional information about the scenario could be helpful for you? So the question becomes, did they let them in the house? They did. Because, I don't know, maybe I'm a little ignorant to this, but uh, I don't know if born in the South, the Confederate flag, if we see that, it's like, okay, they don't like anyone that's outside of their race. So in thinking that way, they probably wouldn't let them in the house. Yeah. So to give a little more detail, because I think that's a good point. Um, this was a case where this nonprofit had been working with this family for over some time, right? The family had kind of said, it's amazing to get access to running water. Please come into our home. Uh, we are happy to allow your students to see what's going on as well. Um, however, the person uh, who typically lived there had actually gone to town. So a friend of theirs was at the place. Um, so it was a really interesting dynamic where this person was like, yes, come into my home, help me have running water but there was no, of course, no acknowledgement of like, oh, I have this Confederate flag or like you are not allowed in this space. Um, you kind of are, I think, picking up on another piece that I think is important information, which is the bulk of the group were students of color, but they were still in that space. They were still in that home. They were invited in for Rotter. Uh, so yeah, any other thoughts? Comment. Uh, this is a lot. Having lived in the South and seeing them as a common occurrence, there are folks that do not understand it as a symbol of them. Yes, I think that's really key. This idea of different people having different understandings of what this symbolism means. Uh, what we ultimately did was we gathered the students after this experience, um, and uh, we actually talked about it. And we had some students name. You know, for some folks, that flag represents uh, tradition and ownership of one's own land. For me, at least, I can understand how some of that might resonate with like native land ownership, right? Stay off my land, stay off my territory, don't tell me what to do. 
Uh, for me personally, that does not make it okay to fly a Confederate flag. I think it is problematic in many different ways, um, but we could at least name that as a community, right? Maybe that's at play. And um, we have two comments. Is it safe, not just physically, but emotionally and talking to the student group and how this resonates with them? That's when like the debrief and the follow-up is most important, especially like when coming. I think, and me and Danny have led many trips that we've had to deal with this before. Um, it's good to hear different opinions and different perspectives, um, as long as you have the follow-up afterwards and maybe the preparation beforehand, like prepping them that these things might happen. Now that this has happened, they can warn them before going on the trip, like you might run into this since we're going um, into areas where people are coming from different backgrounds and have different perspectives and knowledge. Um, yeah. So I think that's super important. And I think what's key, what's key to name as well is that Jacqueline has a master's in conflict resolution. I have a master's, I'm developing my master's, finishing it in social work. And in both of those fields, we're trained to really meet students in these very difficult situations. Uh, we are very comfortable doing that. Um, so when I saw the situation happen, for me, it was a kind of a flag of like, okay, this must be a really important debrief that we have later. I have to structure it well. I have to meet the students, make sure that they're emotionally feeling okay, that they feel safe, that they feel like they can move forward. Um, and it actually ended up going, um, there's an interesting question that I'll circle back to. these students feel providing free labor to a person who may think they should be slaves. Mm -hmm. That's a complicated tension to ask the students to take on and then process. Yes, I fully agree. Very complex and very important that before these students made it to this space, we actually had this training on power and privilege. They realized and thought about how do their identities impact the work they do. If you're interested in learning more specifically about this, I would encourage you to uh, look up one of last year's Rhodes Scholars. Her name's Danielle Gray Stewart. She was actually one of the students on the trip and she spoke about how significant and powerful that experience with the flag actually was. Um, for her, it was the shock of seeing something like that in a space that no one expected to see it. And then having a community to be able to process that, to talk about that, to talk about that exact piece of, I have come to your community to help and I no longer feel safe or welcome, right? I think that's important to acknowledge. And as a part of that for me, it's also acknowledging and processing the idea of, I've come to your community to help. You. What does it mean to be in that community in service? And what does it mean when that process uh, has impacts on you? So if you're talking about power and you have a group of MIT students, yep. definitely are that, that's one definition of power right there. Going mm -hmm. to as it's defined here, a community that has none. Yep. I find it complicated to question to try to hold the people in that there's a there's a power dynamic in holding mm -hmm. the people in that community accountable to something that you believe in yes. your position of. It's not even relevant privilege. It's just privilege. Yeah. So was that part of the discussion? I don't think it was a part of the explicit extract explicit conversation because I think the work that we had done with the students from the beginning really um, really helped us see uh, that. I would say like they were prepped prior mm -hmm. having like had all these discussions mm -hmm. about power and privilege, knowing. Mm -hmm. like the position that they're coming into as MIT students yeah. and knowing that they're also walking into a space where other people have less opportunities or less power, but mm -hmm. also hold different yep. power privilege in other ways. Yeah. So like just having that like realization of who they're coming into this space and who the other people are, what their identities are, mm -hmm. it makes it obviously not a hundred percent clear to the students, but makes yeah. the conversation a little better since they're getting prepped. Yeah, and what I was really getting to was we would never aim to hold in the community accountable. Um, for us, communities are the experts on their lived oppression. It's not our job to come in and tell a community what their challenges are, how they need to navigate, how they need to change. Um, our goal is to learn, to listen. To. Um, so in terms of kind of how do we hold this community accountable, we would never have that conversation. We would never talk about that with the partners because it's not our role to hold them accountable. Our role is to figure out how can we be allies? How can we support the work they're doing, the good work, the ethical work? Um, and also for us not to make a judgment about what is good and what is bad work, right? We are not in those communities. We are not experts. So All we can do is listen and process. Their narratives and their experiences. And there was a comment in the chat saying, 
multiple perspectives and middle ground feels slippery to me because it suggests that those who hold racist views expect to be met halfway rather than having to come mm. all the way to the firm. Yeah, that's a great point. I would say that our conversation, I don't think validated the Confederate flag. Um, I think our conversation uh, negotiated the impacts of seeing a Confederate flag in that space. What does that mean for the public service the students were doing? What does it mean with their identities as MIT students to see that? What does it mean that the person with that flag uh, needs to seek a nonprofit to get access to running water, right? I think that there are just so many complexities there uh, that at the end of the day, I see my job as supporting students and emotionally processing that as much as they can to the extent that's appropriate and they're able to. I know we're at time. Sorry, yeah. Question. How much the situation been different if the owner was actually there? I think it's a good question. Um, and I think often when we're working in communities, uh, we kind of have to cede some of that power, right? In this case, we were working with um, a nonprofit based in the community. So we trusted them, right? We followed their expertise. Um, and I expect that if that had become a conflict, I would have turned to those uh, partners of ours and say, hey, what's the best way to navigate this? Um, and then that's also where the student safety comes in, right? If that partner feels like students won't feel safe or if students are not feeling safe, then it becomes a different question, right? It becomes a question of, do we leave? Do we change up this activity? Uh, do we have a conversation with the organization afterward, right? There's a lot of ways to structure it to kind of get ahead of it in the future. Um, but I think you're right that it very much depends on who's in the room, who's active at the moment, and what is the depth of conversation that we're able to have. I think it's important to know, like all the case, there was two case studies we didn't even get to, um, but you can go on that Excel sheet and I'll have all the cases you wanna look at them. These, there's no right or wrong answer. These are experiences that other people have had that we've had at MIT and other universities. And it's just like, how do you navigate the best way? And there are different answers and different ways of doing it. Um, and it's just having those conversations, at least, and being upfront and being transparent with everyone involved. Um, yeah. I and think I think it's always going to be an issue until hopefully one day, but we wouldn't have a job. They won't be an issue yeah. with any of this, but. I always say that with things like racism, um, it's hard. There are very rarely, if ever, answers because if it wasn't hard, we wouldn't still have racism today, right? It is entrenched. It is all around us. Some of these other isms, definitely all around us all the time. Uh, all we can do is to acknowledge them, point them out in ourselves and begin to engage others in a way that kind of negotiates it, that chews on it, that processes it. Uh, Jacqueline and I have some time, so we are happy to stay after for any questions or anything else. Uh, but thank you all for joining. Please feel free to please feel free to be in touch. If you have any thoughts, questions, recommendations, uh, we are always looking to update our material. Like I said, we understand that this field changes so fast. Uh, so please feel free to uh, follow up with us. Yeah. Thank if you. you. Want to do more case studies during IAP? Uh, we'll have it open, and we're going to just be having those discussions with different case studies. Yes. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.